what influenced me the most to pursue being a chef is that I was able to do accounting. I was able to do human resources. Everybody cooks. Everybody's got to cook. So why not get paid for it? My current occupation is in life is mainly caring for my family now because of arthritis, my uh, art just collapsed. Unfortunately, I had to cut my career short. I was an executive chef for 20 years, but I feel like it was short. I wasn't ready to retire yet, but life happens. And now I, you know, I was able to give my family, I think, a better way of life by being home for them. When you were a little kid in El Salvador, what job did you see yourself doing? Well, when I was a little kid in El Salvador, what I dreamt about doing all the time was to be an astronomer. I always looked up at the scars, always fascinated by space and what was out there. Life before the Civil War started in El Salvador, it was very nice. But I lived right in the capital, San Salvador, El Salvador, in a small neighborhood called uh, Soyapango. And it was the kind of neighborhood where if you got hungry, you just knocked on the neighbor's door and, uh, you know, asked them for something to eat. And they would be more than glad to fix you up something. It was very safe. It was innocent. Everybody knew each other in the neighborhood. There were no outsiders, really. And, you know, you could just be a kid and just get dirty and play all day. October 15th, 1979, El Salvador. Revolutionary government junta, a party backed by the military, stage a coup out of fear of growing support of communism due to socioeconomic inequality. The Farabundo Marti National Liberation Front, an umbrella organization of left-wing groups, planned an insurrection, thus beginning the Salvadoran Civil War. My grandfather was actually heavily involved in the military also. We were the first ones to get the news about the Civil War breaking out. It mostly started with the students. The universities will start having their protests. And then you will see more soldier activity, even getting down to the elementary schools, where you would once just play. Now you couldn't because there would be a truck full of soldiers rolling by. Um, a lot of our friends started getting pretty much um, drafted, like just picked up in the street. Like literally fucking kids that you, you know, just cause they had a big stature, they would like just get picked up. That you'd never see them again. You know, you hear it's like their mother, like cre screaming, running behind the truck or even the dad and just get shot. Your friends just coming up missing. Um, kindergarten in the school when they came and uh, they started drafting the kids in seventh and eighth grade. And um, one of the teachers who had a, a student, you know, honor role student, trying to intervene so they wouldn't take him. And um, this was the gorilla. Um, and they just shot him in the forehead and took the student anyway. Um, shortly afterwards, the military came in and it was five guerrillas that were doing the drafting and they uh, they shot them, they killed them. Then what they did is our school was based in like in a three level, but sort of like a stadium. Uh, they laid the five bodies in the middle of the playground and then they had the whole school march around them and they made sure that you opened your eyes and you saw them so you could see the consequences of what it would be if you wanted to become a guerrilla. So as a kindergartner, this is what you would see in 1980 in El Salvador. I was playing in the front patio. We got three soldiers coming up to my grandmother and to let her know that um, my grandfather had been had been murdered. You know, he was already uh, retired from the military. They went in his office and um, they just murdered him because of his previous military activities. Um, and it was the guerrillas. That was pretty much one of the most in impacting things because, you know, we were close with my grandfather. When did discussions of coming to America begin? My mother had been coming to the country since 69, and she always knew that we were going to be American citizens at one point or another. So that was always on the table. It was just a matter of time of when. In 78, uh, my mother was the first one to come. She obviously couldn't bring me because I was a little kid and she needed to come here first and set the groundwork. In the meantime, I lived between my aunts 
and my grandmother, which, you know, it, it had these bittersweet moments because no matter what, at each four, you still need your mom. But I know that she did it for a very legit reason. It wasn't because she came here to party or anything like that. Becoming a legal American uh, citizen or resident even in four years, anybody would tell you that is a very impressive window of time. So that tells me that my mother came here and it was all business, her getting you know, our paperwork together and then going back finally in 81 to get me. And I've been here ever since, in December 8th, 1981. I was eight years old. My brother, my mother, we were together at last. We were very poor, but we were happy. I mean, still poor. This photo here, it was one of the first photos that I took when I first came to the US in Patterson. As you can see the shirt, yup. Still wear it like that till this day. Does, does it live up to what you thought it would be? Absolutely. No, any, the worst day in America is better than the best day in a third world country. And these are uh, handmade clothes, custom made clothes. Cause over there, you don't just go to Macy's to buy clothes. Here in America, you can have bananas from January to December. And that's not the case in other countries. If you have kids, the ultimate American dream is for your kids to be a better, better American and a more successful American than you were. So the American dream, it's a work in progress. 